Hi, this is Jeffrey Tucker of the Brownstone Institute, and it is my great, great privilege and honor to be here today with James Shirk. And James, uh, welcome. I'm glad to let you introduce yourself so I don't get it wrong. Hi, I'm uh, the director of the Center for American Freedom at the America First Policy Institute. And uh, before I had this job, I served in the uh, Trump White House as a special assistant to the president on the Domestic Policy Council. Right. And you came to my attention uh, a few months ago because, well, I guess it was just about three or four months ago, I was digging around in this whole problem with the administrative state, which I'm just newly alert to, uh, just on grounds of everything we've lived through. And then I bumped into this executive order that was passed two weeks before the uh, before the election in 2020. And I have to say, I was I'm just struck by the that the, there was the most brilliant reform proposal I've seen in a lifetime of watching politics. I couldn't believe it. And I was so excited about it. And I wrote an article called The Astonishing Implications of Schedule F. Uh, what was missing for me personally was to find out well, how that came to be, and specifically who was the the genius mind behind it. And then the genius mind revealed himself in an article in the Wall Street Journal just a few weeks ago, and that that article had your name attached to it. So it's a, such a pleasure to be here with you. Um, I wonder, gosh, where would you like to begin on this story? Because I, I feel like the story needs to be told, and and... I understand who you are and how you came to such insights and and your experiences associated with that. Where would you like to begin? Well, look, I I think the first place you've got to start with is our uh, theoretically supposed to be nonpartisan, apolitical, professional civil service. And the fact is that very many people in the civil service don't operate that way. Uh, Now, to be clear, there are many good civil servants. There are many federal bureaucrats who are sincerely working for the American public, uh, are are credited to their agencies and the institution, and Lots of good people in the federal government. But you don't need terribly many bad apples uh, to cause a lot of problems. And in some agencies, it's almost entirely bad apples. Uh, and uh, look, I, I had, before I came to the White House, I had uh, worked for about a decade in a conservative think tank, worked on a n- number of these policy issues, and thought I had a sense of sort of what the problems in the federal bureaucracy would be like. I had no idea. I had no idea how bad it was going to be, that almost uh, from the beginning uh, when I joined the administration, I, and I joined uh, on the second day, uh, I was hearing constant reports from my colleagues in the agencies about a lot of bad behavior on the part of these supposedly nonpartisan career staff trying to frustrate you know, the president's policy agenda. And look, it wasn't just me. This was making you know, headline news in the Washington Post you know, in less than two weeks um, uh, after President Trump's inauguration. You know, big, you know, bold story you know, discussing everything that the, the bureaucrats were doing to uh, try and frustrate his agenda. It was absolutely ridiculous and unacceptable. Uh, things like you know, regulations and rules. Look, if you want to change policy, there's a procedure that you know, Congress has put in place. You know, steps you have to go through to rescind a regulation a prior, you know, prior administration has, has put through or put through a new one. And you know, the folks in charge of doing those rules were really quick about it uh, under President uh, Obama. And then when it came to President Trump, somehow they didn't know how to draft the rules and they would take forever to, uh, to draft them. Uh, we had one case in the Labor Department that was a priority rule uh, that they were assigned to, uh, it was a team of about a dozen or so uh, lawyers. Their only job was to write regulations and, and policy documents. And this was a uh, priority rule where the uh, political appointees you know, taking a look at this said that if you had a single competent private sector attorney, they could do it in two weeks, maybe three weeks if they're taking a bunch of coffee breaks. They were saying that it was going to take them 13 months to do the rule. And if you looked at the pace that they were uh, proposing to uh, uh, do this, it re- uh, amounted to each employee in that unit writing less than one line of regulatory text a day. Uh, ultimately, what happened was the political appointees in that unit just basically gave up on having the crew staff uh, do the rules and uh, did the work themselves because they just couldn't get usable work product out of them. Uh, or in the, the Department of Justice. Right, the uh, Department of Justice is supposed to be a fairly nonpartisan, you know, apolitical agency. Well, that's not how the attorneys in the civil rights division approached their job. Uh, they basically said, "Hey, look, uh, we have strong ideological views, and we will work on cases that advance those views, and we won't work on cases that don't advance those views." And so, when very, very, very clear evidence of racial discrimination at Yale University came up, uh, showing that Yale uh, discriminated against Caucasians and really discriminated against Asian Americans. 
uh, the uh, leadership in the uh, section said, hey, we're in charge of cracking down and making sure that there's no racial discrimination in higher education. We're going to sue Yale. And the career staff basically came back and said, we're not going to help you with that case. Find other attorneys. We're not going to work on it. Because they understood that winning a case that says, hey, Yale, you can't discriminate against Asians, uh, would undermine racial preferences in uh, higher education across the country. They didn't want that to happen, so they refused to work on the case. Now, Yale was sued at the end of the day, uh, but only because they were able to reassign employees from other divisions in the Department of Justice and uh, use political appointees, which you can do for one or two cases. You can't do it for 10, 15, 20, 50 cases. You can't systematically enforce laws that the bureaucracy does not want to enforce. You can do it for a few high-profile cases using political appointees, but you can't do it as a, uh, a everyday enforcement matter. Those are the kinds of things uh, that, I, I mean, that's just, you know, we did a whole report documenting it, and I could have made that report five times yeah. as long if I wanted to. I, I agree, and I read that report. One of the things that stands out to me was the hiring freeze, because that was... Uh, you know, an exciting thing, right? When mm-hmm. Trump came to power, uh, the the idea, I mean, I I thought a hiring freeze was a great start. You know, let's mm-hmm. let's let's at least, you know, as Trump might say, figure out what's going on around here. You know, before we start hiring new bureaucrats. So tell us what happened to the hiring. <laughs> freeze. That was a very high profile uh, thing. That's right. Uh, very shortly after uh, taking office, President Trump issued a hiring freeze, saying basically, "Hey, we're going to take a look at what's going on with hiring here in the uh, the government, and no new employees can be brought on uh, until we take a look at things." Well, some of the career staff in the Department of Health and Human Services did not exactly support that policy. They were folks they were planning to uh, bring on board into the agency, and they didn't want to not bring them on board. So they took Sharpie pens and basically went and edited the documents for hiring those employees and retroactively, not even trying to be subtle about it, not even going into the computer, just with a Sharpie, a big black Sharpie, uh, retroactively edited the employee starting dates uh, from after President Trump's inauguration to say that they actually, you started on uh, January 19th, day, the day before he was inaugurated, uh, when obviously no such thing had occurred. Uh, that, I mean... <laughs> How did you discover this? How, how did you discover this? Did you just notice that that people were being hired despite the hiring freeze, and and somebody started digging through the hiring records, or how did that? Well, come this to was be? Uh, this was not me. This was people in the uh, Department of Health and Human Services were actually uh, there again. They wanted to see some of the hiring records and were uh, taking a look through the uh, the records and some of these components, and you know, asked to say, "All right, let's see, you see the files for these folks brought on board," and notice these big black sharpie markouts uh, putting in like writing in at hand a new start date uh, for those folks. And uh, they were you know, pretty appalled at that, as you might imagine. But uh, you know, and as you might imagine, the bureaucracy did not ask anyone's permission to do that. They just, you know, on their own initiative, went ahead and decided that we're going to hire these people anyway, notwithstanding sure. what the president wants. So the, the people who found this out were the, were the political uh, up, appointees at HHS, uh, yes. p- people appointed by the Trump administration. So here you have, and I'm sure you were aware of this problem before you went to work for Trump. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, uh, it's an imbalance of power between the political appointees and the, the permanent civil, uh, civil state. Just so people understand, we're, we're talking about, I guess the president uh, can appoint about 4,000. Well, the president appointees. and the cabinet secretary. So political appointees writ large. So many of them, uh, about 1,500 or so, are appointed by the president. Uh, but many others are appointed by the, the cabinet secretaries as uh, their subordinates. So there's about 4,000 political appointees across the entire federal government. Uh, and the entire federal workforce is about 2.2 million people. So you're talking about one political appointee for every 500 or so uh, career staff. And so, look, if the career staff don't want to do something and they're not willing to do something, you do not have you know, an order of magnitude enough political appointees uh, to be able to uh, take on that burden themselves, right? If, if the bureaucracy does not want certain laws enforced, they're not going to be enforced. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the, the way it works is, uh, so you already have an imbalance of power going into this because the career, the career people know that, that this is their career. Uh, they can't be fired, uh, and and they do their they know how to do their job, and their mm-hmm. job is basically their job. How do I put this? This their job is to keep their job and <laughs> to grow their job and and to go to the job and so on and so on. So they they pride themselves in sort of being ignoring um, the comings and goings of the political appointees. Now the political appointees get the fanciest offices mm-hmm. and 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 get all the fancy press conferences and get quoted all over the place and and that sort of thing. But they're managing a staff of hundreds and thousands yep. and tens of, of thousands of people who 
long predate them and uh, fully expect to be there long after the political appointees uh, uh, are, are, are gone. It's a... Uh, and they're I mean, the I'm ones with all the institutional knowledge, right? If they simply, if there's something they don't want the political to do, they just withhold that information. I mean, this was something that uh, was happening at the Environmental Protection Agency, where the lawyers, the career staff lawyers in EPA, uh, had very strong ideological views, and uh, the department was involved in litigation, and they wanted to pursue certain cases and not pursue other cases and make certain arguments that would advance, uh, broadly speaking, left-wing policy agendas. And they knew that the uh, Trump administration political appointees uh, would want to make different arguments, and you might tell them to you know, not pursue those cases. So they just didn't tell them about the cases. Uh, you know, like they'd have weekly meetings where they'd uh, brief the uh, uh, leadership uh, in the general counsel's office on the uh, litigation that EPA was involved in, and they just wouldn't tell them about any cases they thought that the uh, political appointees might be on a different wavelength from the career staff. And so the, the Trump political appointees, in many cases, were blindsided when they'd be contacted by the Department of Justice, who litigates on behalf of the federal agencies, asking about, hey, what's going on in this case? And, you know, uh, these arguments we're making, like, what? what? What case? What are you talking about? And the career staff had simply withheld the information. And it got so bad that the political appointees had to use the public uh, court uh, filing system. There's a system, the acronym is PACER. Uh, basically, you can go online and you know, you know, take a look at every uh, brief being filed in every case in the, the federal you know, court system. Political appointees were using the public online court filing system to see what cases EPA was litigating because their career staff, who are supposed to be subordinate employees, were simply not telling them about these cases. So when they arrived, when the, when the new uh, head of HUD, head of Department of mm -hmm. Labor, the head of uh, tra Department of Transportation, whatever it's going to be, the EPA, uh, arrives with 15 or 20 people in tow, uh, uh, policy specialists or professionals or whatever, yep. um, their very first job is to, to, to bone up on what, what this thing is and what mm -hmm. it does, right? And, and how long does that take? That's going to already take months. Well, it depends who the person is, right? I mean, uh, for example, in the case of uh, Gene Scalia, who was the, uh, the you know, second secretary of labor in the Trump administration, he'd served in the, uh, the Labor Department you know, under President uh, W. Bush. Uh, he knew the agency inside and out. He didn't really need to, uh, to bone up on that much, right? Uh, he had the background information going in. So you know, if you've got someone like a Gene Scalia, someone who's previously served in government, uh, then you know, they can hit the ground running. But if you've got someone coming in from outside of government, if you're trying to bring in, in a sense, a fresh perspective, and again, it, no knock on uh, Secretary Scalia, he was, you know, did an excellent job and uh, also does an excellent job you know, suing against government regulations uh, in his uh, uh, practice as a lawyer. But if you, if you do want to bring in someone from outside government, someone like, say, Andy Puster, uh, who is a uh, CEO of a fast food restaurant who was President Trump's uh, you know, first pick, uh, who wasn't able to get uh, Senate confirmation, well, then they're going to have to be leaning pretty heavily on the bureaucracy uh, to, you know, to fill them in and get them up to speed. And if there's things the bureaucracy just chooses not to prioritize, not to you know, highlight for them, I mean, look, really, people should watch Yes Minister. Like this show, you know, written you know, decades ago about a completely different political system, but it is bang on the money. I mean, like, obviously, it's exaggerating a bit for the sake of comedy, but like the the presentation there is not that far off the truth. Uh, and anyone who wants to see how our civil service works should watch Yes Minister and uh, right. will get a fairly hilarious education in it. Now, this this problem, this problem, it, it far predates Trump, right? I mean, we, we go way back. I, uh, and it was something that that uh, Clinton dealt with, that Bush dealt with, that Reagan dealt with. And and. Uh, all the way back to to Eisenhower, I suppose, but um, uh, but but there are some there are some administrations that or some cabinet secretaries that that have more success than than others, and I'm assuming that 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 the ones that have the most success are those which acquiesce entirely to what whatever the the deep uh, administrative apparatus of of the uh, agency in question uh, desires right and so then they just have a good public face and but if you're seeking change that's where the problem yeah. comes in. Am I right about that? Uh, to a large extent, right? The career staff have their own views. Uh, and again, it's, it's not that there's one person. Uh, uh, it, they tend to lean fairly left, uh, you know, the bureaucracy, certainly in some agencies, but uh, it's not any you know, single one person. But you know, the you know, career bureaucracy in these agencies will tend to have their own views. 
And if the political leadership wants to row in the same direction as the career staff, they are incredibly effective. You know, a, a career staffer who agrees with the political appointees and wants to go in the same direction is an incredible force multiplier. Uh, so it's a, it was just, a, frankly, you know, it's starting to watch from the outside. When the, the Biden administration came in, they wanted to administratively increase food stamp benefits by about 25 percent, a huge increase in spending with no vote in Congress. And to do this, they needed a, a rule done through uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, you know, sort of upending a bunch of, you know, sort of, this is not the way that this was done. But in record speed, the Department of Agriculture put out this rule boosting food stamp benefits by about, you know, 25%. They got it done like that. You know, if the bureaucracy wants to go in the same direction as political leadership and everyone's rowing in the same direction, they are, or at That's least great. they can be, very effective. Um, That's right. But if That's right. they want to go in a different direction, uh, right. then, you know, to a large extent, political appointees are going to be rowing by themselves uh, if they're not actively rowing against the other career staff who are trying to undermine them, uh, right? Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, and that creates a, a strange dynamic. It means that the bureaucracy is always ready to grow, always ready to get yep. more powerful, uh, but but is never, and in fact, the whole, th the whole apparatus is wired against yep. uh, cutbacks and yep. reductions of power yep. or, or reforms yeah. that would be uh, uh, in the direction of, you know, sort of... Um, more power to the people, well, <laughs> for example. It was actually kind of funny. One of the uh, the people I talked to at HHS was relating a conversation he'd had with a counterpart who'd also served in HHS under the Clinton administration. And he was having a conversation, you know, basically saying, hey, you know, you must have had such a much easier time of it because the career staff, you know, would have been on the same page with you and you must have had such a, you know, so much easier to manage them. And the, the response from the Clinton political was actually, no, the career staff thought that we, you know, Clinton appointees were, you know, centrist, you know, sellout uh, squishes and thought we need to be much more aggressive, and we're just constantly leaking uh, uh, against us and you know, putting all sorts of you know, pressure on us to try and push us to be much more aggressive than uh, where the administration wanted to be in some of these issues, right? So uh, it's, yeah, you know, yeah. it's more a problem for a Republican administration than a Democratic administration, but if the career staff think the Democrats aren't being aggressive enough, they will. <laughs> you know. yeah, well, sure. And, and looking back, it was Clinton that, that, that favored uh, welfare reform and, got, yeah. and actually got, got through some stances. So you can imagine that the bureaucratic resistance to that would have been uh, more intense than ever. Hey, let's let's bump forward a little bit because you're talking about what you encountered between 2016 um, and 2020, and it was just a nonstop education for yeah. you. I mean, you just you thought, well, I mean, you expected. <laughs> yeah, I, I expected the grievance. What I did not expect was the the magnitude of it. Right. Like I just right. constantly hearing reports like in the White House. Again, you, you're not the one you know, running the agencies. You're just you're sort of in touch, you know, coordinating with the, the folks in the agencies, making sure everything's you know, going in the same direction. If there's sort of conflicts between the agencies, sort of adjudicating those, making sure everyone's doing what the president wants. And I would just be constantly hearing from the political appointees about these you know, types of incidents and how the career staff were trying to undermine the president's agenda. And it was, you know, incredibly frustrating to everyone. And it was very much on President Trump's radar screen. And, you know, his directives were very clear uh, that, you know, he wanted the bureaucracy to be serving the agenda that you know, he was elected to implement. And so part of my job became, how do we find a way uh, to hold these people accountable? Because you know, the president wanted to hold them accountable. And under the current system, it was not happening. And they just felt very free to say, in so many words, you know, the people elected uh, you, but we have our own views, and that's what we're going to pursue. Yeah. You know, I, and I do want to say, go back to it because I remember when, after Trump got elected, there seemed to be, like, he came into the presidency with an attitude uh, that maybe, for example, if he had taken over, a, a, you know, a casino mm -hmm. or, a, or a large corporation or something like that, he's like, okay, I'm now, I'm now the elected boss. Uh, let's, let's earnestly try to reform the system. Um, did you did you get the sense that at some point he began to realize that that there's a way in which but the challenge challenge was much greater than he ever uh, anticipated. Well, look, I, I can't speak for uh, President Trump in that regard. I, I haven't had that conversation with him, so I, I won't uh, sort of you know, speculate uh, out of turn. I'll say on my part. Uh, that again, I, I sort of went in knowing that the career staff were liberal, knowing that you know, it'd be very hard to uh, you know, to fire them, but sort of expecting, okay, you're going to have some frustrations, but you know, at the end of the day, you know, the boss is the boss, and you know, folks will accept orders even if they're not you know, sort of enthusiastic about it, but they'll get the job done at the end of the day. The extent to which the answer was basically, 
up yours now, uh, or let's find every way we can to sort of like stymie you and thwart your agenda really shocked me. And was, yeah. again, one of the things that uh, drove me uh, to basically be saying, look, we have to combat this. You know, we know what you know, President Trump right, wants yeah. done here. You know, I, I was given you know, responsibility. I, I asked for the responsibility of you know, finding yeah. a way to, uh, to carry out the president's uh, you know, uh, desires here in this regard. And, and, I, and it is so needed. Uh, by the by, the time the, the the pandemic hits, so you have the chaos of of February and, and March of of twenty twenty, and then uh, uh, then we know all the the unfolding events where you really had, you know, an administrative bureaucracy, NIH and and CDC mm -hmm. exercising enormous uh, power and control. I mean, to the point that. Uh, you know, we know after Trump left office, I mean, the yeah. CDC felt free to just impose a nationwide mask mandate mm -hmm. on transportation. But but before that, you know, I mean, like for, there was a period in which every business in America had plexiglass up, you know, and that was a re CDC recommendation, never voted on by the Congress, never yeah. approved by the president. It just it was just seemed to be happening, yeah. this, whether it's the stay home orders or the, the, the it's just uh, the uh, the quarantine uh, p periods of time that were that were issued, the domestic capacity restrictions, all. And then you have uh, Burks's own book, uh, Deborah <laughs> Burks's own book, in which in which she and others, uh, James. There's a couple of things that shocked me about this. Oh, yeah. One was, of course, that she 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 just admits that she was altering reports yep. and and going around the elected officials of of, of, mm -hmm. of the White House and working very deeply and, and personally with the administrative bureaucracy. So she admits that that's shocking enough, but that but that she brags about yeah. it and feels as if. There's not going to be any downside to doing this. That this is actually sort of good for her career. Um, I'm sure in those the, the extremely difficult days that there was a perception that you know everything you had seen going on for the previous years was now multiplied uh, many times over. Yeah. yeah well, look I, again. I was not uh, sort of involved in the uh, coronavirus task force. That was not in my uh, my portfolio. So I, I'm not going to. Uh, speak for you know those who are on there, uh, but I, I will say that you know, again. You, you take a look at some of these things, like Dr. Brooks's book, where you know, in hindsight, look, it's clear the lockdowns were too excessive, uh, that the sort of the the cost that they imposed on society and especially on you know, on children uh, was you know, excessive relative to the benefits that they didn't actually have that much public health benefit, and people sacrificed a lot for not a lot of benefits. It's clear in hindsight, and you know, many folks have. I mean, you know, one say I. Let's not do more of that, right? But uh, folks have been saying, well, how did the Trump administration you know, get this so wrong? Uh, and you know, just you know, you know, went farther than they should have. And I, I think part of the answer to that is that, you know, as Dr. Burke says, the Trump administration, the president's appointees were saying, this is going too far. Uh, you know, we do need, this is a public health issue. We need to take you know, answers or measures to combat this. Uh, and, and look, Operation Warp Speed was a tremendous success. Uh, I think, you know, arguably the single greatest you know, public policy success in the, uh, the post-war era. You save you know, millions of lives and trillions of dollars. Uh, but at the same time, when it came to the lockdowns, you know, they were saying you know, to the career bureaucracy, you guys are going too far. You know, let's see, you know, moderate these recommendations. Uh, you shouldn't be doing this. And what Dr. Burks writes in her book is how she was, in her own words, engaging in, quote, workarounds and, quote, centrifuge to be having the bureaucracy sending the message out to everyone who was following this federal guidance, you know, make it you know, super strict, while hiding the, that message from the politicals who were reviewing it, right? The, the message that was coming from the president and from his you know, senior staff were, you know, we've got to take a more balanced approach here. And what was being you know, implemented and carried out by the bureaucracy uh, was basically not that. And after the fact, they boast about it and say, look at these wonderful subterfuges and workarounds we had uh, to make the lockdowns very strict, even when that's not what the White House you know, senior you know, leadership was, was calling for. It's, it's appalling. And look, it's a threat to democracy. Right, like we hear all these you know, issues about threats to the democracy, and some of them are laughable. Right, like the notion that requiring a, a photo ID is any sort of threat to democracy is you know just you know, off the wall insane. This is a real threat to de democracy. If the people can elect whoever they want, uh, but the bureaucracy is going to do what the bureaucracy wants to do, and the elected leadership cannot meaningfully hold the bureaucracy accountable and cannot you know, remove them from their positions, that is a threat to democracy. The government needs to be well, accountable it, it, to the people. 
Right. It's an end to representative government. I mean, you don't uh, <laughs> you really have to get back to basics. What are we going for here? You know, the idea is that we're going to have a government that's responsive to the people through the representatives. So this uh, this extra layer of machinery uh, is is uh, it's not in the Constitution. Yeah, it it uh, it's it's something completely different. Um, just to go back to the to your own personal history here, because we went through the summer. Now we're approaching the fall. Now the election is coming. Coming. Let me just ask you: At what point did it occur to you that 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 that, that the the job protections themselves for the civil service could be uh, tweaked or altered in a way that would, uh, would on the margin, increase accountability. I mean, to to me, this is one of the great, I would say, insights, because it's a a small change, but it it could have big effects. You know, was there, was there a moment when you, James Shirk, was, you know, just having a cocktail or, you know, (laughs) like, where was, when was the moment that it occurred to you? that you could make such a change and it could have a dramatic effect. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what it was. It was in uh, January of 2019. Uh, it was in my office uh, uh, in the Eisenhower Executive uh, Office building, which is next to the White House. And basically, uh, folks would come back from New Year's and yeah, from you know, Christmas vacations, but it was still relatively quiet. And I was saying, look, we've got to do something to hold the bureaucracy more accountable. There has got to be a way we can do this. You know, I've been getting two years of reports from the agencies. And you had, you know, you know, what my, you know, my call sort of downtime to the extent that downtime exists in the White House, but time when I didn't have an urgent priority and could just, you know, sit and do some, you know, research and was looking through uh, Title V of U.S. Code, uh, which is the section of uh, federal law that governs the federal workforce. And in Section 7511 of Title V, uh, it discusses the authority the president has, uh, or the government has to exempt, uh, you know, positions uh, from the uh, civil service rules and regulations. And this is the authority that's used to create a political appointee positions, like a Schedule C position, right? Where if you're a Schedule C employee, you're, you're at will, right? You can be fired for any reason. Um, and let's take a look at it. And the language did not say you could exempt people to create political appointees. It says the president uh, or the Office of Personal Management can exempt uh, positions uh, if the president determines uh, they are of a confidential policy-making uh, policy determining or policy advocating character. And the sort of the light bulb moment was, wait a minute, a whole lot of career positions could be considered policy making, policy determining, policy advocating, or confidential. Nothing in here says that only political appointees uh, can go into Schedule C. Nothing in here says that you can only take away the civil service protections for political appointee. It's if you've got a role in basically shaping or influencing policy. It's an authority that covers policy influencing positions, not just political positions. Now, again, to be clear, out of the entire you know, 2.2 million you know, person bureaucracy, uh, a, the vast majority would not fall under that definition. All right. If you're an IRS agent or a wage and hour inspector uh, or a border patrol officer, you know, that, that does not cover you in any way, shape, or form. But when you're talking about the sort of the senior headquarters staff, you're not the, the IRS agent doing the audit, but the person in headquarters in Washington writing the guidance, you know, governing how the audits will be conducted or, you know, writing the regulations that the companies, uh, uh, comply with. Those guys fall under that definition very easily and handle, like, that's what they do. I mean, you've, the vast majority of this, this policy work is done by career staff precisely because there's so few political appointees. And so my estimate was the, the Schedule F executive order would have covered about 50,000 out of the 2.2 million uh, workers in the federal bureaucracy. So on the one hand, that's, that's not all that much. It's about 2 3%. On the other hand, it's the most important 50,000 because of the people yeah. who are telling all the rest of the bureaucracy what to do. And, and, and there's also yeah. an important symbolic value here, too. I mean, it's like, OK, now we're going to have accountability yes. for the first time. Uh, if you start dabbling in, in policy making, basically making legislation, yeah. uh, you could get re- reclassified. Uh, and so this was January 2019. We can we can reclassify these people in a, in a way that makes their positions more consistent with uh, representative government and 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 at will employees. If they're if they're doing legislation, yeah. they should be accountable to the American people through yeah. their elected representatives. So that occurred to you in January. Now we've got a full year. You were working on the legal uh, aspects of, yeah. of this reclassification. Yeah. So yeah, look. 
no one in uh, in administration does you know things by themselves. I mean, there are a lot of people who worked in this, and so I had that idea. I circulated it. Uh, you talked to uh, other folks uh, and different components and the agencies. You know, got you know people's feedback and uh, worked with them to you know, turn it into a, a first draft of the uh, an executive order. Um, what happened was in, in a bit, so that, that you know, takes several months. Again, you, you've got to do your legal homework, you know, make sure that this is you know, legally sustainable and did, look, did all that work and found that absolutely, <laughs> uh, you know, the case law says that if the president wants to do this, then he can do this and the court's not going to second guess it. It's, you know, it, yeah, yeah. Straightforward might be uh, a too strong a term because there was a lot of you know, digging and uh, work that went into it. But uh, the answer that came back was basically, yes, you can absolutely do this. Um, and so I had uh, w- worked with other colleagues, put this together in the form of a draft executive order, uh, when basically uh, some career staff at the Office of Management and Budget uh, got wind of this. We'd been uh, operating a very close hold, you know, sending out paper copies you know, in the mail so that you know, no emails floating around. But um, the career staff uh, at uh, the Office of Management and Budget you know, ultimately uh, did uh, get wind of it. And I was told, quote, lit their hair on fire. Um, so that, uh, that basically prompted another round of review, uh, in so many words, to mollify the career staff who understood immediately the implications uh, of the order, uh, and to the office of management budget, all they do is policy. You know, basically everyone at OMB was, was going to go into schedule F. Um, and that prompted another round of review and, uh, just, you know, not exactly a box checking exercise, but a sort of like, are we, you know, are we really sure about this, uh, given the you know, freak out you know, from the career staff? And the answer that came back was there was, again, a, a sort of you know, close hold meeting, you know, several high level officials, including you know, senior officials and you know, several cabinet agencies. And the answer that came back is this is a great policy. We wish we'd had this from you know, January 2017. It would have made our life so much easier for the past two and a half years. This is fantastic. This is a policy win. Uh, we think this will be a political win. This is great. However, uh, basically, we're, you know, we're on a, not exactly glide path, but we're on a clear path to finish all these major regulations and major you know, policy changes that, that Trump wants. The career staff, we've had to fight with them, but we, we've now got, you know, the teams in a place where we can get these done, you know, you know, by the end of the year or early 2020. We don't want to do anything that could, you know, sort of, you know, jostle the, the elbow or, you know, you know, shake up the apple cart or whatever metaphor you want to use, you know. Let's do this after we've issued all those, you know, you know major regulations. You know, say the spring of you know, you know twenty twenty, then we're not going to you know, cons- you know uh, worry about our reg writers, you know, lighting their hair on fire quite so much. And then you're you're sort of clearing the you know the decks and, and getting ready for a, a second term. You know, uh, should uh, the president win the election, and so that that was the plan. Basically, we we put the order on cold storage and with the plan of uh, sending it to the lawyers and the Department of Justice for review in early twenty twenty. And it was indeed sent to the lawyers in the Department of Justice for review in early 2020. Uh, but you might remember that there was something else going on at that time. Uh, and the, the COVID pandemic hit. And that basically uh, sucked up all of the, the bandwidth uh, and capacity. Uh, when there, and, and rightfully so. Uh, very rightfully so. Uh, how do we respond to this? What measures you know, can and, and should the government be taken uh, to respond to this, uh, this public health threat? Uh, but still, it was a priority. Um, I, I was informed that you know, President Trump had been briefed on this, uh, not by me, uh, but by you know, people more senior than me. And his answer was, we absolutely need this, you know, make sure it gets through and gets approved. And this is not to be left on the, the cutting floor. You know, COVID is a priority, but this is basically, you know, right up there in that second tier of everything else that's, uh, that, that's not an urgent COVID priority. Make sure this gets to my desk. I want this. Uh, and so ultimately, uh, we you know, uh, concluded the sort of back and forth with the lawyers in the Justice Department uh, in uh, early October of 2020, and it went uh, to the president's desk, and uh, he signed it, and that was about uh, ten days or so before the uh, uh, before the election. Before the election, and then yeah, you know, Biden, uh, you know, uh, obviously took office and rescinded it uh, in pretty short order. Uh, but right, and ve- it's yeah. Very lay quickly. down a marker so that, uh, you know, if President Trump yeah. uh, gets elected again or if a, a different person comes in who uh, has, you know, uh, policy views that differ from the Biden administration's, it can be reissued just like that. Yeah. Well, you know, it must have been I've been I'm trying to think back, you know, of what it must have been like for for Trump in those days, because there were a lot mm-hmm. of things going on between March and, and the election that were uh, mysterious and uh, over which he felt like maybe perhaps he didn't have any control because he was done with uh, with lockdowns and with mm-hmm. with uh, all the impositions and the regulations and the attacks and the panic and all the stuff 
you know, by, by August and September, uh, completely done with it. And they made it very clear on the campaign trail that this was the case, that he, ready, he was ready to go back to, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a growing economy and a normal life. But meanwhile, there were these people running, running around like mm-hmm. crazy, as Berkshire reports. And he really was not in a position to do anything about it. I mean, that was my read on the situation. I mean, people kept demanding, well, why don't you fire so-and-so? Why don't you fire this person? Why don't you fire? But the, the problem was that, that, I mean, he couldn't. Yeah, and look, I, I don't want to speak for uh, for President Trump, and I, I wasn't on the coronavirus task force, and you know, I haven't spoken directly to him on this, so I, I'm not going to you know sort of uh, speak out of turn there. Uh, but look, I, I will say, just you know, taking a look at you know, Brooks's book and you know, everything I know about how the civil service operates, uh, I mean, look, part of this is they were just you know trying to hide the you know, hide the ball from political appointees, uh, and, and she says as much, right? That the president you know knew what his policies were; he made that very publicly clear. Uh, you know, both inside and outside the administration. Um, his senior staff knew what those policies were. And the his sort of senior career staff did not want to implement those as Burke's you know, documents in her books and was just looking for ways to hide the fact that they were doing other policies you know, from the you know, you know, political appointees uh, that they reported to. And so there's a, I mean, look, in the, the government, for the most part, the authority rests with the political appointees, not with the career staff. But the career staff are the ones who then do most of the actual work, but they're doing it in the name of the, you know, the cabinet secretary or you know, whoever the, uh, you know, the appropriate official is. It's not in the, like, it's not the deputy assistant undersecretary of, you know, such and such who's issuing the regulations being you know, issued under the authority of the, you know, the secretary. Uh, right. But while they have the, the political appointees have the, the authority, they don't have the knowledge of everything that this, you know, two million man bureaucracy is doing. And so the career staff will systematically try and hide things from politicals that they think politicals might tell them to do differently and they don't want to do differently. Yeah. Right. And That's, Dr. Burks is boasting in her book about how they did that to make the lockdowns more severe. Yeah. Uh, uh, let me uh, uh, go back to that day, that wonderful day in which the executive order was was signed, uh, promulgated uh, 10 days before the election. It was a chaotic time. Mm-hmm. Trump is out on the campaign trail. Nobody was paying any attention at all. You must have felt a great sense of professional satisfaction I, and victory. Yes. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, sort of uh, attenuated by the fact that uh, the president was not inaugurated for a second term and you know, the order was never fully implemented. Uh, but it's, you know, look, the bureaucracy is a huge threat uh, to democracy. And the fact that so many of the bureaucracy, and look, there are many, like, this is not, I don't want to paint with too broad a brush. There are many good civil servants out there, many who, you know, don't like the policies that, you know, their you know, superiors pick and then decide that they'll, you know, faithfully implement them anyway. So I, you know, while I'm focusing on the, the pain points, I, I don't want to paint too broadly, but th- those bad sure. actors no, no, are, are a real threat to our country. And I, I, I felt, uh, yeah, just great pride at being able to do something that will finally enable the yeah. American people to take control of their government again. Now, the executive order, specifically what it ordered was that every bureaucracy do a review of its uh, of its staff, yes. of, of the yes. civil service, to see uh, who would need to be reclassified under uh, a system of, of representative government. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But there was a date put on that, and if I recall, it was something like 60 days. 90 days. It would have worked out to be basically uh, a day or two before the inauguration. Um, Before the inauguration. Yeah, the the basic point was, again, the the president and the White House staff, uh, and even in many cases the cabinet secretaries uh, themselves and the agencies, are not going to know every position that's going to fall into this. If you're looking at about 50,000 positions, there's no way that, you know, (laughs) know, the White House and the president are going to say, here's a list of all 50,000 positions. And you can't even go by job title because a position that might have some responsibilities in in one agency might not have those same responsibilities in, in another agency. And so the idea was agencies, you're going to do this review, take a look through your positions, find those that are of this sort of you know, confidential policy making, policy advocating, policy determining. In other words, policy influencing positions in your agency. Make a list of them and send them to the office of personal uh, management and ask them to uh, be put in Schedule F. And any position that went in this Schedule F would be still a career position, right? The 
The freak out from the other side is you're trying to politicize the bureaucracy. And the order expressly said, we are not doing that. In fact, agencies, you're not going to hire or fire these people based on political factors. We're not looking at campaign donations or, you know, who you've endorsed or anything like that. You know, and look, right. if Trump wanted to do that, the order would have said do it, right? But that was not the goal. Right. The goal was not uh, right. to turn these into political positions. It was to turn them into right. accountable positions. Yes. Uh, and basically say, uh, you know, send them to OPM, and OPM will then put them in this new Schedule F. Uh, sure. we currently, we've got Schedules A through E in the accepted service. This is the yeah, next one in line, Schedule F. Uh, and anyone in that position will have the same uh, civil service protections as a political appointee, which is to say you'll have none whatsoever. Uh, and it, 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 basically, the order left a lot of discretion to the agencies to decide what they needed to do. It, it set forth some guideposts, uh, but basically said, agencies, you know your business. You know, tell us who they are and take care of it. And, and it might have been, in the end, just round one. You know, there were probably fights ahead over this stuff. Well, but, uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Right. Uh, but between – so between the election and – and so you, now you have fully, you know, like two months, three – really three months in which the executive order is 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 law. Mm-hmm. Um and the agencies were supposed to be busy reclassifying things. So after the election was called for for Biden, you still had this long period of time yeah. in in which technically these agencies were supposed to be looking supposed yeah. to be looking at this. Do you have any evidence that there was anything going on to implement the executive yes. order? Yes, I mean it's it basically varied by agency. All uh, right, some agencies say. I mean, again, in luck. Right when it was clear that uh, the president was not going to be inaugurated uh, for a second term in January 2020, uh, and we were very much on a sort of like you know you know on the clock in, in terms of things you get do, all the agencies were prioritizing and trying to basically get out the door their top priorities. And something like this, where Biden had said he was going to rescind the order, uh, was not a particularly high priority uh, because you know you, you knew it wasn't going to last, and there are other things you could do that you know, that might last and uh, would have more of an uh, impact. Uh, but that said, some agencies still wanted to lay down a marker and say, look, we do have a lot of these policy influencing uh, positions, and we're going to demonstrate you know, sort of the potential impact of this order. So well, where some agencies just did sort of a box checking exercise and basically, nah, nothing to see here, or, you know, we've got like two positions. You know, other agencies really did a very rigorous review and uh, took a look and uh, you know, sent in very detailed uh, requests to the Office of uh, Personnel Management. One of those was uh, the Office of Management Budget, which is this White House component uh, that basically is in charge of you know, producing the, uh, the presidency of budget proposals and reviewing all regulations that uh, agencies review. So it's, it's, it's quite powerful because every agency regulation has to come to OMB for review. And OMB... Uh, take, took a look at their positions, and uh, quite rightfully so, I think, said uh, 88% pr- uh, percent of our positions belong in Schedule F, uh, which is correct because all OMB does is policy. Like the, the entire, like, it simply exists to help the president manage policy across the rest of the, uh, the you know, federal agencies. Now, there, I don't think there were many, if any, other agencies that would have that many people going into Schedule F. Um, like in most agencies, like I said, I think you're, you're looking at 1% to 3%. Uh, but at OMB, where all they did was policy, and look, OMB career staff have immense influence on federal policy. There are quite a lot of OMB career staff who have more policy influence uh, than a lot of Schedule C political appointees in the agencies. Those people have an enormous role uh, on the uh, policies that are, are implemented to, uh, to shape Americans' lives, and they should be accountable to the president. Right. Uh, do you have a? Do you put a number on the number of agency uh, reports that you expected in? Are, are we talking about fifty, a hundred, four hundred? Well, every agency was required to do them. I, I didn't uh, track uh, at the end you know, how many ultimately went in. Uh, again, because we knew that many of the agencies were treating it as a box checking exercise, and uh, you know, basically said we'd rather focus you know, our time and you know, efforts on things that. Uh, you know, might actually stick around. Um, so I, I don't know exactly how, how many uh, were ultimately submitted. I, I do know that there were some. I, I know that the Department of Agriculture, uh, for example, took it pretty seriously. Um, Department of Treasury, from what I was told, did not. Um, but, you know, again, you know, it, had the president been inaugurated for a second term, part of my job would have been working with the agencies to say, hey, you know, good job. Or, you know, you, you don't think you got anyone? Uh, look at all your fellow agencies that thought differently. Why don't you? Uh, and the order was structured that way you know, to basically yeah. uh, provide for sort of multiple layers of review and you know, going back to the well over and over again until you got everyone that you know, actually belonged in there. So a couple more questions about about this period. You you um, well, I, I want to ask about. You said that Biden 
had already made it <laughs> clear his intention to repeal the executive order. I want to ask about that when you found out about that. But let's go back to the order itself. Did you were you curious about the media response or the public <laughs> response? And, and were, did you follow it? Uh, yeah, no, it was more or less exactly what we expected, right? Like you got complaints from Congress and from the federal unions uh, that we basically hadn't uh, looped them in. That came out of the blue. Uh, at the same time, they're lighting their hair on fire and saying this is the worst thing since unsliced bread. And how could anyone contemplate such a terrible, terrible action? Um, and so, like, you know, we kept it close, old uh, and quiet because we knew that they would hate it. And we didn't want to give them a heads up and, you know, an opportunity to try and you know, pressure us to uh, to scale it back. I mean, it's, the reaction was more or less you know, what we expected. Um, I mean, one of the things that I mean, I may, may be surprised is you know, too strong a term because I'm not surprised at this point, but just like. The degree of media ignorance and the degree of them printing things that are simply not true. Like, and I'll give you like a very uh, typical uh, example of this. So you can Google Schedule F, and if you look in that October you know, 2020 time frame, like Google Schedule F and Trump and read some of those stories, and they all talk about how this is undoing the Pendleton Act. And you know, the Pendleton Act was the act that created a merit service into the spoil system in 1883. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. none of them talked about is that actually under the Pendleton Act, federal employees were at will. The president couldn't fire you for political uh, reasons, but beyond that, you didn't have any appeals rights. You had there was no, uh, you know, board you could appeal to and say, "Hey, I'd like a trial to determine if I you know, was actually a bad enough performer to keep my job." And that was because the reformers who created the civil service said, "Look, yeah, yeah we want to regulate hiring. We don't want people hired based on political connections." But firing, you've got to keep these people at will. Or you're just going to seal up intransigence and incompetence and insubordination. And so, like, they very deliberately said, "We're going to." ensure a merit-based hiring process while leaving the back door wide open to get rid of folks who uh, right. wind up you know, passing that merit screen who perhaps should not have, right? And so actually under Schedule F, uh, these employees would have had far more uh, removal protections than under the Pendleton Act, right? The, the notion that federal employees get to appeal their removal, that wasn't, it didn't apply to the general federal workforce until the 1962 uh, President Kennedy executive order, right? Like for the first yeah. eight decades of the civil service, uh, yeah. the typical federal employee served at will, uh, or it would like the, none of them had these appeal rights. Uh, right? right. And so, but the, the entire media coverage, oh, he's undoing the Pendleton Act. He's going back to the yeah, spoiler right. system. And, like they knew nothing about this topic. Might, they knew nothing. Right. And I took the bait too, as you know, <laughs> I mean, probably read my writings. Could I, yeah. cause I said, I said, wow, this is, you know, this, this undoes the Pendleton Act. Yeah. Great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, look, I think the Pendleton Act is good policy, right? Like there's a lot of federal jobs that require, you know, sort of in-depth technical you know, expertise and knowledge. You want to be hiring those on the basis of, you know, sort of your ability to do the job and not based on if you, know, you do door knocking or make campaign contributions. But at the same time, if you've got people who just are bad at their job uh, or are trying to undermine the president, you've got to be able to say you're out of here. And that's what Schedule F said. Yeah. You know, we're going to keep a merit to your hiring process, uh, and we're going to keep these sort of merit to your principles and primitive personnel practices. But if you're your captain of resistance, well, goodbye. Uh, let me ask you something, as long as we're digging through this this deeper history. I mean, the administrative problem of the administrative state, you know, traces way back. But uh, uh, tell me if I've got this right. In the New Deal, it became a particularly big deal because you had all these three-letter agencies being created and the Washington balloon and beyond belief. And then you had uh, federal bureaucracy mm -hmm. specifically engaged in in, in, in politics for, for FDR, who, mm -hmm. you know, ultimately held four terms. Am I right that the Hatch Act of 1939 yes. was something of an effort to to do something about this problem? Well, yes and no. So the FDR issues have nothing to do with civil service protections. Uh, you didn't, you know, basically, no federal employees had the right to appeal the removal. You, you have an internal agency process where the, the supervisor basically had to say, here's why I'm going to fire the guy. And, you know, the, you know, the employee had an opportunity to respond. But then if someone else in the agency, the deciding official said, you're out of here, you're out of here, you couldn't appeal. That was, that was the law for basically everyone up until 1944. And in the Veterans Preference Act of 1944, uh, Congress had all these hiring preferences for veterans, obviously, you know, the soon to be returning heroes from World War II, and basically, we're going to reward you with your first crack at federal jobs. And then as part of it, they basically said, well, agencies, you're not going to honor these hiring preferences on the front end and then circumvent them by just canning the guy the next day. So if you fire a veteran, then they get to appeal to the Civil Service Commission. 
well, flash forward two decades, and then there's an awful lot of veterans in the federal government uh, you know, by the 1960s, with both of these hiring preferences, and then the, the huge portion of American you know, men who served in World War II, right? And so Kennedy was, you know, basically said, look, this is kind of arbitrary that veterans get to appeal and no one else does. Let's, uh, let's extend these appeal rights to everyone. And then that was basically the framework that it got you know, modified in a few more executive orders. But then that was what Congress codified in the law with the Civil Service Reform Act of 1978, codified these external appeals. But when, for the majority of the, uh, the Roosevelt uh, administration, uh, these employees did not have the right to appeal the removal. Uh, that said, there was an awful lot of mischief going on because this was when you know, Roosevelt was obviously uh, supersizing the, uh, the federal government, creating all these new administrative agencies. They were getting all sorts of delegated legislative power and you know, your federal spending was uh, exploding uh, relative to where it had been historically, uh, although not so much relative to where it is today. Uh, and yes, you had you know, a lot of uh, government employees, like in the Works Progress Administration, being used uh, to go after President uh, Roosevelt's political opponents. And some of those opponents, even within the Democratic Party, did not like that so much. They thought it gave the president too much power over Congress if he could use his employees to try and uh, influence elections and uh, you know, deny re-election to members of, of Congress. So uh, I believe it was uh, Senator Hatch of uh, New Mexico, who's a Democrat, uh, not the more recent uh, and recently departed uh, Senator Hatch of uh, Utah, who's a Republican. But it was uh, Senator Hatch of New Mexico who sponsored the Hatch Act that basically said, look, if you're a federal employee, you're not doing anything related to partisan campaigns or political activities uh, while you're on the job. That's just not going to happen. Yeah. And, and so that, that Hatch Act then is in the spirit of, of, of the, of the, of the Shirk Act, I guess yeah. you could call it. No, no, like, uh, the, right? The, the Schedule F was entirely President Trump's executive order. Uh, that I, I mean, I, I give him full credit. You know, I'm, I'm glad that I was able to serve in the administration. Uh, but like, I, I heard from folks who were, who served in the, uh, the Bush White House that, you know, this was the kind of idea that would have been laughed out the door and that they never would have contemplated, you know, in the Bush White House. You know, I'm I'm glad I was able to uh, to work on this policy. I, I think it was a big win for the country. But you know, all the credit belongs to President Trump. Yeah, uh, I, I know we're running short of time, but I just want to ask it's, it's two additional questions. Something related to what you said earlier. But but first, when did you when did Biden make it clear, or Biden's uh, the incoming administration make it clear that they had every intention of of getting rid of this executive order? When, My when did, recollection when did that is, it was at some point, and I want to say late December or early January 2020, 2021. I again, I'd have to go back and look out, uh, look at notes, but a week. We had heard at, um, at some point that basically the incoming sort of uh, Biden transition team uh, members uh, for some of these uh, civil service agencies had revealed to the career staff that Biden had planned to. Uh, so I want to say it was early January of uh, 2021, might have been uh, late December 2020. Uh, but it was, look, it was clear from the get-go that uh, you know, Biden had campaigned as a champion of the federal workforce. He'd taken the endorsement of basically every major federal union except uh, you know, those involved in enforcing immigration policy and had made it very clear that, look, Trump had done a lot of things. You know, Schedule F was only part of it to hold the bureaucracy accountable. And he'd you know, said very unkind things about all of those, right? So he hadn't made any formal announcement, uh, but it was very clear what the policy directives were going to be. Uh, and, you know, you only had to look at the people who were on his transition team to say that, all right, this thing is not long for the world. And indeed, on the right. third day of uh, that President Biden was in office, he signed an executive order uh, repealing the whole thing. The very first day. And it was called something like Save Our Civil Service. It was, it was something like that. Like, you know, it was like protecting, <laughs> you know, the, I think it was called Protecting the Federal Workforce. Executive Order <laughs> 14003. Uh, so. right. right. Now, uh, thinking about the future, this is obviously hugely, hugely important reform. And I'm just so glad about it because it, it actually gives me a point of optimism at least Republicans uh, or whomever mm -hmm. um, has a path forward here um, obviously the executive order is is one path but but that's vulnerable too mm -hmm. right because it can get replaced by another executive order do you see this this reform uh, agenda ultimately being embodied in, in legislation uh, passed by Congress that's hard right that the the federal unions, basically exists to represent the federal bureaucracy, right? Like, you know, the United Auto Workers are representing, you know, auto <laughs> workers, right, in, uh, in Detroit and in, uh, uh, you know, GM and Ford and Chrysler factories and, and the like. But the, the federal unions basically represent the federal bureaucracy. Um, they're very politically involved, and they've got a lot of allies, uh, you know, 
uh, you know, basically partisan allies uh, on uh, Capitol Hill, and they recognize, uh, I mean, look, what is the value proposition of a federal union uh, to a, a bureaucrat in the federal workforce? They're not allowed to negotiate over pay and benefits, so they can't bargain over things that matter the most to private sector workers. So why, do, and, and the government's right to work, uh, you know, both you know, under federal law and, and constitutionally under uh, the Janus decision. So if you're a federal employee, why would you, you know, pay several hundred dollars a year to federal union? What's the, the sales pitch? And the sales pitch turns out to be that, guess what? We've got your back. If you had a house worth, you know, half a million dollars, would you pay a few hundred bucks a year in insurance uh, to uh, make sure that if anything happened to that house, you'd be uh, compensated and reimbursed? Well, yeah, obviously, yes. But what is the value to you of your future income stream you know, from your federal job? You know, what is the value of you know, knowing that you can't lose your job? Well, yes, you've got these civil service protections, but we know how to really work the system to make them ironclad. Right. And, and they do actually. Right. You know, union arbitrators, we have a paper coming out documenting how these union arbitrators rule in union grievance uh, uh, cases. And it turns out that in three fifths of cases, if an employee is fired, but they're represented by a union and file a grievance, the union gets them with their job back. Union arbitrators overturn most removals that agencies you know, try to work through in the federal government. And not only do they get the job back, but they typically get back pay. Uh, and so it's, the sales pitch is we are going to help you uh, keep your job. We will work the system every lever in it. To, uh, to make sure that you know, nothing happens to your job. Yes, you've got the self service protections, but we're the gold standard. And so anything that weakens their ability to do that is to them just a massive threat to their value proposition. Like, if the union can't protect your job, if you're not well employed, what are you paying for? What are you paying for? They're not negotiating pay. They're not negotiating benefits. I mean, some fraction are sufficiently ideological enough that they'll just you know, join the union regardless. But for a lot of their workforce, uh, a lot of their members who pay the dues, it's because they're paying for the, precisely this sort of protection. And so the unions, you know, that's why they react like Dracula handed a garlic lover's pizza anytime you propose making it easier to fire a poor performer, right? A lot of federal employees are frustrated with the poor performance of the bureaucracy, but the unions are lockstep against anything that makes getting rid of them easier uh, because that is their value proposition to their members. We've got your back. We are your insurance policy. You cannot get fired from this you know, nicely compensated federal job when you've got union representation. So the uh, you're saying that the, the Congress they're very powerful over members of Congress yeah. of, of both parties. Yeah, I mean more on one side of the aisle than the other, as you might expect. But you know, by no means this is exclusive to the Democratic Party. Uh, so I, I think the yeah the most likely path forward is basically presidential action. And look, the good news is the the president has a lot of statutory flexibility. Uh, that the uh, laws give the president, as we demonstrated, a lot of discretion, and, and there's more that can be done. Part of my job at the America First Policy Institute involves, you know, you know continuing to work on these issues and finding you know, more ways that uh, any administration uh, that wants to, uh, you know, can you know, exercise this uh, degree of authority over the federal workforce. Um, and so the, the president has a lot of authority. And look, if a president chooses to tie his hands with his subordinates, if he wants to say, all right, you can be a horrible employee, and by executive order, I'm going to make it impossible to fire you. He, he can do that, right? And the voters can hold him accountable, and if, if they don't like the quality of the service, it's fine. But the key is if the president does not want to tie his hands, if the president wants to be able to hold the workforce accountable, uh, if he wants them to actually implement his policies, then he has to be able to do that. If, if for us to be a democracy, the federal government has to account to, uh, to the, uh, the president, who in turn is accountable to the American people. You cannot have... The, the federal workforce say, we're going to pursue the policies we like, and if you, the elected person, don't like it, well, tough cookies. That, that's not how democracy operates. Yeah, yeah. Well, the uh, paper that you wrote for uh, after, you, after you left the Trump administration, you began to recount your history, and that is posted at the America First. Yes, so, so uh, anyone who's interested in that paper uh, can Google uh, the Center for American Freedom at America First Policy Institute, and then we ha have just a, a number of policy papers up on there. Click, uh, click on the tab for policy papers. Uh, it's entitled Tales from the Swamp, How Federal Bureaucrats Resisted the Trump Administration. And right. you just... It, Read what happened. Read what uh, the bureaucracy did when President Trump tried to change. It wasn't pretty. This is this this paper is mind blowing. It's, it's actually the best account of of real life in government I've read since uh, David Stockman's uh, Triumph of Politics. Actually, <laughs> I think it's a, a a document for the age ages. And James, I want to thank you for your your intelligence, your persistence, your discipline. 
um, and uh, your in, your insight, and I think you could be satisfied that you've made a, a an enormous uh, difference and given a, a real path forward. And I appreciate the hour you spent with me today. Thank you, James. All right, thank you so much.